hello and welcome. My name is Karen O'Connor and you're listening to Menopause, Marriage and Motherhood. Hello and welcome. I'm here today with somebody that I've really looked forward to talking to and that is Pamela Anderson from Emily's List Australia. Welcome. Thanks, Karen. So lovely to be here. I'm very excited to be part of uh, this conversation as well. So let's just start with a little bit about, well, first of all, what Emily's List is and then how you came to be involved with it. Let's get the background stuff out of the way and then we can move on to the deeper meaningful questions. All right, let's do that. So um, (laughs) Emily List, first of all, Emily is not a person. A lot of people think it's named after a person. It's actually an acronym. It stands for Early Money Is Like Yeast because it helps the dough to rise. So our core purpose is to help women once they're pre-selected um, to then run campaigns and to with the view to get elected. So well, our core purpose is getting more women into government um, so that we can make sure that uh, good policy for women and families for put into place and remain in place. So that's kind of what, what the, our core purpose. We're also um, fight for women's, um, we've got six values that we um, underpin what we lo- um, advocate for and what we lobby for and what we will fight for, basically. So we are a pro-choice organisation. We do believe that women should have full autonomy over their bodies and that women should be able to make choices without fear of criminalisation, discrimination or violence. We also believe um, that uh, gender pay gaps are equal pay is another one of our core values. We believe that um, uh, just because what occupation you choose doesn't um, so if, you, if you choose to take on a caring role um, you should not be disadvantaged um, by taking on something that's seen as paid less in society we know that that's kind of undervalued at the moment or well, not kind of it is and also that we also don't think you should be disadvantaged for taking time out of the workforce to care for your family such as children parents ca- uh, cousins and aunties um, and that should not impact you in retirement that's something that we're seeing uh, a lot of women going into retirement almost uh, poverty stricken um, uh, we also believe that uh, access to affordable um, um, early childhood education and care is really important. It helps to get women um, into the workforce so they can go back to um, to careers that they want to go into. They're not just going to go back just to work just to hold a place and all their money goes towards childcare. And we also know that it's really good for children from an early age to have that um, socialisation and that, those foundations nice and strong. Um, we also believe in gender equity. Um, that's something that we're really, really passionate about. Uh, obviously, we don't believe that anyone should be treated any different because of the gender that they are or identify as. Um, and we believe that everyone should be treated um, as humans and it's just basically a human right to be treated with respect. And diversity, um, we believe that we are better by having more diverse people in governments, in corporates, in courtrooms, in boardrooms, everywhere. Um, we think that we are much better by having diversity. And that diversity includes gender, so women. Um, we've fought for the um, affirmative action laws, um, rules that you see within the Australian Labor Party, um, where we actually have 50% representation of women in most um, states. Um, there are a few states that are a little bit behind, but also our federal government at the moment is um, 50% women and actually for, in actual fact the caucus is 60% women. So we see much better policy coming from um, that balance and we're also really excited to see too a lot of uh, diversity with culture, religion um, and of course ethnicity as well. We want to see big culture around that and also ability. That's another thing too that's really important to have those. Everyone should be represented at, at all levels. And um, a new one that we've introduced um, just um, in the last 12 months is respect. So we believe that everyone has a right to live without violence and fear of violence and that's especially and unfortunately still happening to women and children in this country and around the world and we just think that that's something that needs to be completely stopped uh, as much as we can so there are our six values and that's really what drives our organization and that's how we decide how we will advocate seek policy around and also um you know campaign around so they're the that's our core values i was reading an article um i don't know whether it was from your website but i think it was in the age where they were saying that emily's list is the reason that uh the labor party has that equal representation as opposed to the liberal party which as you know has a complete dearth of women (laughs) in it particularly in cabinet yes (laughs) julie bishop's about the only one that i can think of (laughs) 
Yeah, but... that's true. Yes, that is our So our founding members, so we were founded by Joan Kerner, Julia Gillard, Carmel Lawrence, uh, uh, some of the big names, and there was a lot of other hardworking women in the background that also helped the foundations. Um, we've got also legends such as, you know, um, uh, you know uh, Sharon Jackson, Candy Broad, Claire Moore, and we've got uh, also Cheryl Davenport, all founding members of our organisation, which we, and I know I've missed some because we've got an amazing core of ama- like really awesome women who fought hard 25 years ago, nearly 30 years ago, to get those rules put into place so that today um, the Labor Party um, looks the way it does. And, and they are all Emily's List women. Um, in some states, the rule was put in just before Emily's List was started, but it was our founding members that fought for those those rules that then caused, I suppose, birthed Emily's List, so to speak. So, yeah. So what is it you actually do? You, if, if a woman wants to stand for government at any level, you help support her and train her. What do you do? Yeah, so we don't necessarily get involved in council. Our focus is on state and government and the reason, sorry, state and federal governments. Um, and the reason for that is we want to get policy in that helps women and, and families. Uh, and with council, they don't necessarily have policy. So, you know, gender equity policy, pay gap, sorry, legislations, um, you've got, uh, you know, the, the equal pay laws, those type of laws, you know, pro-choice, so uh, 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 decriminalising abortion laws. They're the really, they're the big things that we've fought for that make life just simply better for for women and then flows into families and then just, you know, if you make life better for women, it's going to help everybody. Um, so that's the um, core purpose of what we do. But, yeah, you, you're 100% right. Yeah, so I have a friend that went into local government, for example. She's the only one I know that's gone into any kind of government. She left after about two years because she found it so toxic. Yes. (laughs) And not just from the men either. The women who've been in there a long time, yeah, can be quite vicious. So, Karen, it's interesting you say that because I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. But um, I have... Local government's not our area that we don't necessarily, we don't help get women elected into that area, but we do provide training, as you said earlier. So we provide training uh, and then we provide mentoring and we provide campaigning. So we'll actually literally come out and campaign shoulder to shoulder mm-hmm. with our, our women. We fundraise for them. We really get in, 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 into the nitty gritty. But local government, I have, I have a few um, concerns about. I think there is a toxic culture happening in local government. And, yes, it is happening to women. And, yes, it's happening by women to women and also by men to women as well. So it, I think there's a really toxic culture in local government that needs to be addressed. There was actually a report done by um, the Vic state government um, just recently addressing some of those issues. So that's something that uh, even though it's not in our, it's not really what we do, but it is something I, I believe we have a responsibility to support all women who are elected. And so that is something that we're going to be turning our mind to very shortly to try and support, support women in that area because it's just people say to me oh can you encourage so I'm, i've got first nations heritage can you encourage more first nations women to run for council it's like well i know that there's toxicity in this level the difference the reason why it doesn't people say how come it's more toxic in local government and not so much in state and federal and the reason for that is it, firstly the media will call it out and also you there's not there's also parties so you've got in local government most people sit as independents so they're not aligned to a party so you know i'll use the labor party as an example so those state and um, federal government you're aligned to the labor party so the labor party has a set of values and then now they've got a code of conduct and if you start breaching those rules they're going to kick you out do you know what I mean so and we see that happening with the liberal government too people getting asked to leave the party because they don't longer meet their values and so when you've got a party i think there's more you have to behave a bit more because there's a there's a consequence whereas in local government people can treat each other however they like because there's no consequences there's no one's going to say well you've got to leave do you know what I mean there's none of that consequence so they can basically do what they like it becomes incredibly toxic it's not just toxic for the councillors it then becomes toxic for the staff as well and so I think that, you know, that's something that really, really needs to be addressed. If we want to, especially if we want to get more women representing and more good things happening, we need to um, have, uh, we need to address those issues, especially when it comes to gender equity as well, because you're just not going to get there uh, if, you, if you're going to have that toxicity. Toxicity. No, toxi- yeah, no, you know, and it's, I just find it interesting that, yes, it, it's okay, it's great, like, don't get me wrong, it is great to have party lines like this is appropriate behavior but hang on why isn't that why doesn't everybody see that appropriate behavior is a basic 
requirement for being in any kind of representative position. Well, I 100% agree with you. I think that there should be, um, the, yeah, there should be codes of conduct around behaviour. I mean, the fact that you even have to have a code of conduct is to say be nice to people shocks me still. But, I mean, you see it. You see it, but people seem to think that there is some exemption to good behaviour for some reason. You see it all the time on social media, for example. People believe that they're allowed to treat people however they like, um, you know, and, and there's sort of like, I suppose, if there's no consequence for bad behaviour. People just think they're allowed to do it. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's just, it's, it astonishes me. I agree with you. It astonishes me, but I, it, it's just the fact that we have to even have these conversations and go, well, people, we have to have a code of conduct that tells you how to be nice to people. You know, this is how you don't bully. Like, I mean, it's just, I, I just, yeah, it, it shocks me still to this day. You'd think that in 2023, for God's sake, we would have worked out um, how to be kind to each other, especially after what we've all been through in the last couple of years, you would think that there'd be a lot more kindness and a lot more front of mind to say, you know what, you know, I don't agree with that person or I, 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 that person's point of view is not what I would agree, but let's have a listen, see if we can meet somewhere in the middle. Like, I mean, that, that, that's sort of how I think, you know, adults behave. <laughs> I, like I was going to gonna say, you know, having a co code of conduct <laughs> kind of seems a bit kindergartenish. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Please. Really is. It's just, it's just, yeah. It shocks me. It does. It really shocks me. And it's and I I know this is really biased. So I shouldn't say it, but it, it almost it shocks me more when I see that behaviour coming from women to women. I know yeah. it shouldn't, but um, it, it, I just go, oh come on, guys! Like you know, we, we've all fought so long to get women to these positions. We have fought so long to you know get this balance, and now we're going to rip each other apart. Like come on, let, let's push each other up. There's enough room for everybody. The, one of the things I was going to ask you about is the different kinds of discrimination and, and this kind of feeds into it nicely mm. because there's I grew up with overt sexism and oh what do you call it you know the patronizing kind of oh it'll be all right dear yeah. you know yeah <laughs> dad still does it drives me insane <laughs> but he's 85 so you know forgiven dad you forgive yes. But there's, there's so many more subtle kinds of sexism now, aren't there? And, yeah. and, and it, you talking about the women, you know, the, the toxicity from other women is kind of one of them. It's almost, uh, uh, what's the word, a Stepford Wives kind mm. of that, you know, women should be this and all you women are doing it wrong because we need to be like this and look up to our man. And <laughs> pass. I'll pass on that. <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh, gosh. That's a really, yeah, that's a really good point. I'm just trying to think. Yeah, so there are different types. So misogyny, though, is what underpins all of it. And yeah. I think, too, something I'm sort of, you know, realise misogyny doesn't just come from men. It can come from other women as well. And misogyny is basically where you just, it's that internal um, viewpoint that, oh, because you are a woman, you therefore don't know how to do x y so, i'll give you like one of the things that's always annoyed me is that women are bad at math or women can't you know manage money as well, well hang on a second. that's not true do you know what I mean i've got a seven-year-old and if you ask her what's your favorite subject she says maths do you know what i mean and she's damn good at it and interesting i was similar as a as, as a when i was young i was good at maths good at maths and then when i got to about year nine everyone starts telling you that oh actually girls aren't good at maths so, you know, so then it's that sort of that it's, it's that behavior that's instilled and mm. it's that, so that, that's, that's, I think what you see a lot of it, it's, and I think there's a lot of good stuff been happening too, to try and break those, I suppose, gendered stereotypes. It's just that, that subtle type of, it, it is misogynistic, I think. It, it all comes under misogyny. I mean, we don't have this. Well, we do still have people pinching people on the bums and wolf whistling and stuff like that. It, it's that doesn't happen as as often. You'll see the subtle, you know, uh, subtle, uh, which is you know, exclusion. It's uh, possibly you know, um, not sharing of information, which is something that is uh, you know quite awful. Uh, so you see that sort of stuff happening. But I think yeah, it all comes down to it's just that tone of misogyny which just needs to be thrown in the bin how do we combat that though because that i mean if i look at even school kids <laughs> certainly when kids hit the high school years it is ingrained yeah i i don't claim to have all the answers for it but um i think that <laughs> the i think really it starts it's it starts with showing 
showing, especially young girls, um, showing them what they can be and then and celebrating, um, I think. So if, if I'll use an example. I was talking to some women the other day and one of the women said that she was the first girl in, in one of the, her area to do woodwork. And that was in the 1980s to participate in a woodwork class. And she had to fight to be part of this woodwork class because they were trying to send her off to sewing. Well, that's, so, do you know what I mean? Like that, that's crazy. Like, you know, I think having more women and, and enga- encouraging more women and telling women, you can be a plumber, you can be an electrician, you can be all these other things. You can be a CEO, you can be an accountant, um, you can be, you know, financial advisor. You can be all these roles that you might see mostly men in, but we need to see more women in these positions. We need to celebrate the women in these positions and we need to show these teenage girls that there are other occupations than, say, hairdresser, teacher, um, childcare. You know, you can work on a construction site if you want. You can be the, the dogman whistling to, for the crane. You can do these roles. There's no reason why you can't do these roles. And if people, I know that historically they'd use, oh, women, have, you have to lift things uh, at above a certain weight. Well, it's not good for anyone to be lifting anything above a certain weight. So that's rubbish, do you know what I mean? So thank goodness for um, discrimination laws which prevent that sort of rubbish from occurring. But, you, you know, I think this idea that, you know, women can't do something because they are weaker, women can't do something because they don't have the, or, or all women are, unintelligent in a particular area is absolutely ludicrous um if you look at the um our makeup we're actually no different to men um and we have the same brain structure we have the same i mean where we do differ is obviously through puberty but i mean we don't actually have the different in, in intelligence levels from men or women you know um so it's just crazy to think that that we couldn't do something that a man could do and it just it, i think for me i've got two daughters I always encourage them to do whatever they want to do. I don't ever say, oh, no, girls don't do that. I know that when I was learning to drive, I wanted a bigger car. And Dad said, no, no, that's a boy's car. I said, mm, I think I want it now. So I always say to my daughters, oh, they say, oh, no, that's a boy's color. But even though they're little, I said, that, 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 oh, that's a boy's color. I said, no, no, colors don't have a gender. It's just a color. So I think there's we, we can do a lot with our own family with our own you know networks just by changing language i think is a really big important one allowing people to explore and then encouraging more women to go into these spaces where where we don't see a lot of women encouraging these women and celebrating them when they're there as well to try and encourage more women yeah and, and it works vice versa too doesn't it because how it do we get the men to accept traditional women's roles as being okay for them to go into I agree. And look, I remember in my, one of my daughter, both my daughters and they went to childcare. Um, there was a young guy who was working there and I thought, this is great. Awesome. Right. But then some parents complained. Yeah. And I thought that was absolutely heartbreaking. And I thought that poor guy, he wants to work with children. He could be like, oh, why would he want to work with children? Because he probably enjoys playing with kids. Like not in a creepy way, but you know, like, you know, he, he wants to educate early you know early education they're educators by the way they, they're not they're, they're professionals mm. they're educators he probably wants to educate that foundation level and i thought how wonderful to have a young guy doing that but unfortunately he got pushed out because people made awful assertions that why would a guy want to be in that role well, because he probably wants to educate the young minds he can he understands the importance of that age group and says, well, let's educate them now. And I thought it was just brilliant, but unfortunately he did leave because of that. And you're right, it goes both ways. Uh, You know, there's not enough male teachers in schools at the moment. We need male teachers in schools because especially, um, you know, we're young young boys, they need to see that um, men can become teachers. I think teaching is a fantastic profession. Um, and I think it's really sad that uh, a lot of the, a lot of men are actually walking away from. They're walking away from it because of preconceived ideas that people are applying, and that's something that we also really need to address. I don't have a solution for that, but that's something that we really need to start thinking long and hard and say, well, you don't ever presume, uh, assume some awful allegations against someone because they want to take on a particular role. Yeah, it's it's a really difficult one, isn't it? Because I mean, mm. one of my second son, he's an actor, so totally in touch with his feelings as you can imagine but he had a part-time job where he went into daycare centers to do the singing and dancing a few times a week but then think of the wiggles the original wiggles were all men you know and they were all primary school teachers as well i know 
I know. I think I just, yeah, an occupation should have no gender, really. No. Let's be honest. Do you know what I mean? Uh, I think it's just ridiculous to, uh, you know, start gendering out. I, I, I personally hate the stereotypes that we apply to people and I think that's it, that's that's the issue. It's, it's funny. I actually saw someone talking about how, this is probably a little too far, but how um, gender reveals uh are already stereotyping. I was like, oh, okay, well, technically, yeah, but, you know, they're kind of fun. But, you know, technically, yeah, yeah you might I, be right. I watched, um, there was a program on it a couple of months ago about parents who are choosing not to reveal the ident- the gender of their child until the child chooses when they're like seven, eight, nine, chooses which gender they want to be. And, and I think of my, so I had two sons, then two daughters. So I had, let's call it boy toys, just because yeah. my eldest was in <laughs> trains and Lego. So we had trains and Lego, <laughs> everything Thomas the Tank Engine and everything Lego. It's fine. So when my eldest daughter was born, having worked in the construction industry myself, I was like, yeah, I'm not buying any girls' toys. I'm just not going to, don't see it. When she was about two and a half, she went to a friend's house who had all girls' toys, dolls, prams, feather yeah. bowers. My daughter thought she died and gone to heaven. <laughs> she put every feather bow on. She's in the high heels, the sparkly skirt, everything. She'd never seen any of that toys till then. <laughs> and it's, but it's a personality thing, you know, Correct. because then I think of my second son, who's the actor. He liked to dress up too. She likes to dress up. The eldest yeah. one wants to build stuff and make <laughs> railways, you know. The youngest one was just music and art. It's all yeah. different. And 100%. it's great that I got to see that difference and that, it, you know, I did wonder at the time, I'm like, oh, my gosh, is that just built into her that she's a girl and she wants all these, these dolls <laughs> and wants to push brands? I never wanted to do that, by the way. <laughs> But the youngest one didn't. So it's just, it's interesting. It is. And like you, I've I've got two girls. And like you, my older one, sing and dance and all that. And, and you know, whereas my younger one, she she likes, she she's obsessed with the Barbie, but she wants the aeroplane and she wants the cars and she wants that sort of, what's that? <laughs> And then and Lego and like, I mean we just we like you we sort of um and having said that my oldest one was obsessed with Thomas the Tank Engine for a period of time which I don't really like that show it's too annoying it's a bit <laughs> creepy so I mean no it's fine it's fine but yeah so it's, it's, yeah <laughs> but I mean I think it's just you know it's important for kids especially just to let them explore right there should be no oh you're a boy so therefore you can't dress up like that yeah I think it's just I think we put too much pressure on uh on on kids but then you don't and then there's there's the opposite way where you know there it's you know no gender at all and all that i I mean look i don't know what the answer is it really does come down to the each individual kid and each individual person as to what's going to work for them and to each family but i just the one thing i would say is just don't teach your kid to hate people because they're different Mm -hmm. you know like just you know i suppose maybe that's where all this toxicity toxicity starts like don't if you're you know don't teach your kid to judge someone because they do like to, if, it, if it's a boy and he likes to wear high heels then great you know because i don't know about you but there have been boys wearing high heels for a very long time you know go all the way back to the french royal families and in the 18 16 17 1800s they all wore high heels women didn't men did so you know um they all wore pink too so you know it, it's just there's been a it's, it's been a society change that's actually de- deemed these things to be a particular gender so I just think it's really there's an opportunity for us in our generations to start teaching our children just to be nice and just to be don't to, don't and just accept people for what they are and uh, and just to embrace that embrace liking everything you know why can't you play with dolls today and then play with trains tomorrow? Mm. I, I struggle with the especially younger people when they are afraid of something different because I think that's where a lot of it comes from and and I I struggle with that like oh my goodness why at such a young age are you so afraid of difference I agree with you 100% Uh, and I I really I think that's that's the concern young people should be exploring young people should be open to different you know like I know yeah we we embrace in our household we embrace you know great that's awesome what's different you know unique let's be honest unique is fun different is fun you know you don't mm. really want to be the same that's gonna be boring <laughs> i know <laughs> all the same boring 
You're boring. <laughs> I know. So when you let's let's actually go back to the topic here. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's great. This is my usual episode. <laughs> let's just go all around the moon. Talking about when I suppose I'm coming at this with a specific question in mind. Or not no no not question, specific assumption. Okay, good. Here's my terrible assumption. If a woman wants to go into politics, it's generally because they see an inequity and they want to change it. If men go into politics, it tends to be because they like the power. <laughs> Vast generalisation there. Apologise to any man who doesn't fit into that, that, little, that little hole that I've just built. <laughs> 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 but how do you, is there that kind of difference? And, and no, I suppose that's not where I want you to go. I think what I'm asking is how do you support the women? Because going into politics to make that kind of difference doesn't seem to be the general reason for entering politics, certainly in the last 10 years. It seems to be getting way more towards I want to create my own little fiefdom. I want everything to go my way. Yeah. Look, I know a lot of guys who are in politics for the right reason and who are doing it because they genuinely want to see um, change. There's a, they're, they're there because they've either had grown up with adversity or they've been around people who've grown up and they want to actually go and change things. They, they want to see the world get better. I know a lot of um, male MPs who do that. Um, but, yeah, you are right. A major, I, I'm not going to say all women because there are going to be some women that are going to want to go in there for power. That's not, that's not you know, um, should we put that. But I think a lot of the women we work with, uh, well, mo I'm going to say all the women we work with, um, uh, are there because they, ha they genuinely want to see, they want to see better policy for women. Um, they want to see the world a better place for um, for families. They want to see um, more inclusion. Uh, we've got a lot of women who will come to us and say, I want to run because I represent my community, a multicultural community or a cold community, and I want to represent because I think that, you know, we don't have enough people who who look like me in, in, in Parliament. I think we need to be represented in Parliament. And I also want to fight for this particular um, a change in, in, in legislation and law. And so we're like, awesome, that's great, you know, and we'll support them. We support them by training them firstly. So we do these training courses um, that show, that really gives the, nuts and bolts and then also the nitty gritty stuff of so what you need to know we uh, and sadly we also have to teach our women that they that women get more attacked when mm -hmm. they're campaigning so women will get more vile social media women will get more um um, verbal attacks they're at higher risk of being stalked all these other things but we also teach them how how to ch how, how to work through that and, and try and encourage them for that not to be a deterrent my concern is that sort of stuff is a deterrent some to some really good quality potential candidates the media we know will also uh, attack more progressive women as well um which is something that is awful um they'll they'll always have a negative there's more comp not always there's more negative spin against a, a progressive woman than there are a, of a conservative woman um which is really disappointing um and we so we we do these training programs that tries to help them work through that we give them mentors mentors are really important because mentors that person that will help you navigate through these things when when it gets difficult Campaigning is not an easy thing to do, so it, it can be quite, you're giving a lot of yourself to the public and people, for whatever reason, think when you give a lot of yourself, they're allowed to say what they like about you, which can be quite confronting and difficult. But having said that, there's a great, great group of network women, especially in our organisation, that will come and support um, the, the candidates during that time. Uh, and then we physically will go out and letterbox, we train people how to phone bank, we train people how to door knock. Um, and we stand there um, on election day and hand out to people and say, hey, vote for a great woman. Uh, woman. And so we do all those sort of things. We support in that way. But it's, uh, it's, it's you know, as for, you know, wanting to go in with the right, I think if you're not going in it for the right reason, those type of things that you're going to face, so if you're going to get attacked by media or you're going to get attacked on social um, socials, it's going to be harder to do it because you don't have that, end goal if you're just striving for power and then people are coming at you for all, all directions that's sort of not going to drive you i don't think to the next level because it, it's being a candidate's not easy it is it is hard um it, it can be quite exhausting and so you need to have that real true belief that you're going to do something great that you really want to do that, that the change you want to make is so important to you that you're going to keep pushing through and that's what i think keeps a lot of the people going
That's a really good point. How did you get started with this in Emily's List? So I got started in Emily's List because um, just after the 2018 election when um, the Morrison government was voted back in and I was just angry with the way women were completely and utterly ignored. And I've also been a ma- always been a massive Julia fan, always been a massive Joan fan. So, you know, I always sort of heard what Emily's List was, was a member for a while, but didn't really sort of, you know, get involved, but got really active in, in Emily's List after that because I was like, no, we need to get, um, we need to get good governments in. We need to get good women. And so I started to get involved by just going to the local meetings. So I live in Victoria. So going to the local meeting in Victoria, we have one in each state. And so going to the local meeting, uh, meeting with some awesome, fierce feminists. So it was really cool. We would have these amazing conversations. We would talk about, you know, uh, you know, great stuff that had been done or things that should be done. It just became like you walked into the room and went, I think I found my people. Um, so it was just, uh, it was just amazing. Um, and then after a while, after a few years, um, working with the, and getting active and helping and, and with events, organizing events and getting involved in fundraising, I then became the state co-convener. Um, and then I have a, um, have a financial planning background. So I got, um, you know, I like to say tricked, but that's not very nice. I, um, uh, I then became the treasurer because it's, it's a fantastic and an, an honor to hold that role. And then, um, our previous CEO, um, was, uh, decided that, um, it was time to move forward. That, you know, she'd done her, she'd done what she felt she could do with the organization and decided that she wanted to move on. And, um, so I sort of uh, put my hand up and said, oh, okay, I'll give that a go. And, uh, here I am, the CEO. So it's been, um, it's been a, an amazing journey as a CEO. Um, I've, we've worked on five campaigns, I think. And, I'm um, very excited that each of them have gone our way. So not that, you know, we're the, but we like to think we have an influence on it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say, how do you train a, a political candidate? What is involved in that? Yeah, so there's like basics to, you know, there's a few other programs around the traps too that are training women on the basics of campaigning or becoming a candidate. So, you know, you've got your pathways, you've got your politics and colour, you've got a few other groups that are um, coming together and doing that training. But our training is more specific for the party. So we we train our women on how to fundraise. We train them on what you need to do um, in order to be successful with phone banking, um, engaging, a, get, how do you pull together your campaign team because you can't do it on your own. And we sort of really give them that checklist of what they need to do to pull together a really strong team to then have that that support behind them to then go forward. And then we um, also help them, if they are successfully elected, we then also help them with um, uh, some documents that we put together that helps them put their office together as well. So um, it's just, it, it's, yeah, so it's mostly um, training about how to fundraise, training about what the laws, what the rules are around campaigning, uh, what you can and can't do. And then there's obviously the more party specific stuff, which we can do because we're, we are associated to the Labor Party. So we do more Labor Party dedicated training for our candidates. So, yeah. And what does that involve? So it's more about, you know, how to navigate through the party, how to, you know, get yourself seen, how to, um, you know, sh- you know, demonstrate to, you know, your, your, the, the, the particular party that, you know, you're someone that they should definitely have as a candidate. Um, and so it's those type of little things that, you know, we sort of teach them what they need to do to get to that. Um, level where they can be successful for pre-selection we don't get involved in the pre-selection side of things but we do definitely um get 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 them enough knowledge that they know how to navigate their way through that system which can be quite you know unique as you're saying it i'm like i kind of know all this but i was completely not present to it at the same time (laughs) it's interesting isn't it because I know we all know how the political process works, but I don't think I've ever thought of it from if you wanted to stand as a representative, exactly what it takes. And yeah, it's interesting how intricate it is. Like I know there are a few other because uh, the, the Liberal Party doesn't have anything similar. Does it have anything similar for for the men? Is there something similar for men, or is this just like specifically created? to support the women in the Labor Party? Is that the only one that is available? 
So we are ex we are we are only here to support women in the Labor Party, but I have been told that the Liberal Party has just recently started something similar to us to try and support women through um, their party, which we think is absolutely fantastic. Mm. And I mm. really hope that they have a lot of success with it because we're not we, we, even though we only support and the only reason we we only support Labor women is because. Of, we want them to be progressive. We want them to be looking at the policies that we believe are important. And whereas, and, and, the, and the Liberal Party, we want to see more women in that party. We want to see more diversity. We want to see better representation because it's important to have all sides of government well represented and robust enough to really drive the country forward. Yeah, and even in, throughout Parliament, like it shouldn't just be, you know, the party of men, which is kind of the way it's going. <laughs> Is the Liberal Party, and then you got the diverse party over here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And look, I don't know. I don't, Charles. I don't know if the Greens have done anything, but it would be good if they did. But the for independent for those that want to run as independents, there's things like Pathways to Politics and Politics in Colour, and a few other organisations that are coming to the front. Um, that are able to do that, those type of things as well. So the government's actually invested quite a bit of money in trying to get women to. Get interested in getting elected it's something that they've actually done they've had been, been quite a few grants that they've actually given to organizations to try and help them to encourage more women to get elected and so that's something that's really front of mind which i think is really great and there's also been a, a really strong program for local um so local government as well so there's a big program on at the moment so i, I can actually get the details to you later if you like and if you want to um, share it but there's a there's some uh, programs too to help local women um get into sorry local government uh, women to get into local government which is also a, really it's a, local government's a good place to start if you kind of want to dip your toe in the water um it is political though a lot of people think oh it's not political but it is very political you are entering into politics uh and so i think that's something too that surprises a lot of people when they get to local government yeah it surprised my friend and that's like a country town as well which is far more conservative far more set in the ways but also in a way completely removed from either state or federal politics because it's a little country town, you know? Yeah, and look, councils actually play a big role in those country towns. Mm. They're actually very important in those country towns because often they are the, the main sort of point of contact for any discrepancies or any of those. And often you're talking about a lot of the issues in country towns may be more around council-based issues so you're talking roads you're talking accessibility properties you're talking development um or you know uh, licensing you know permits sorry for um farming etc so that's probably that's more of a local government level and so you know they, they play a bigger role i think in, in regional so what happens when you actually get elected do you support people then because like for anybody that's not listening in australia who's not in australia We've had a lot of bad press just recently about the misogyny and mm -hmm. the sexism and the sexual assaults and all sorts of predatory behaviour, particularly in federal. We hear about it in federal government. I have yeah, no okay. doubt that it kind of oh. filters its way down through Oops. state government and everything. Do you support women through that process once they've got elected? So traditionally, we, we haven't given a lot of support. Um, so our model is, so there's an Emily's List USA, and our model was a little bit based on that where you got them elected and you went, see you later, but keep the door open for the next woman to come through. <laughs> but we're actually finding that when women, especially new women when they're elected, so we, we do ha assist them to find buddies in, in Parliament, so other women who can help support them. Um, we also do check in quite a bit with them and make sure that they're okay and provide any support that they might need. But it's it's some of it's something, and we also will help them campaign to get re-elected as well, but not to the same depth that will help new candidates. So we do support them, um, but we also keep a relationship with them because they're that that's how we want to put forward policies or, 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 you know, talk to them about policies that are important. So, for example, we're working with um, some of the women's uh, health ministers in different states at the moment to try and in improve um, uh, some of the abortion laws in, in through, I'll use Victoria as an example, even though it's decriminalised, accessibility and affordability is still an issue. And so we want to make sure that that's addressed and that, you know, any woman who needs some health care can access it, not regardless of whether they're regional or um, or, or, their, or what's in their um, bank account. We don't want people to be disadvantaged for that. And so we're really wanting to address affordability and accessibility because that's something that um, we know is still causing a problem, especially in regional parts of um, 
of states. Uh, and so we're working with the health ministers to, to get those type of policies addressed, to try and get better conditions for women uh, and to make sure that, you know, healthcare is healthcare and it's, and it's, and it's treated as healthcare. So... Let's just move briefly because I'm looking at the time. We're going to have to finish up in a few minutes, but, which is a shame. So I have so many questions I want to ask. Let's move briefly on to Indigenous women as well because you're on, you've recently created in Emily's List an Indigenous program as yes. well, haven't you? Yes, we have. So I've got ancestors who are Aboriginal, so I'm very proud to be uh, associated with the Yorta Yorta and Gonai Konai mobs, um, and that's from my father's side of the family, so I'm just very, very proud of um, that ancestry. Um, and as as that, I'm a big believer in leaving the door wide open and putting your hand out and helping them step up. So we've create, we've embedded First Nations Emily's List Australia, which is called Fenella at the moment. We may change that name. Um, and that's designed to help get more women, First, First Nations women um, elected, but not just elected too, getting, getting them, encouraging them to work in policy, encouraging them to work in minister's office, encouraging them to work in MPs' offices. So there's a lot of careers that can come out of um, politics as well. You don't just, if you don't want to be an MP, you don't have to be a, a, a member of parliament. You could also potentially work for someone and have just as much influence if you wanted to. So we're really working hard on that place. And that's, um, that, that's a continuation of um, a project that was started many years ago by Joan Kerner, which was called PEN. And there's some amazing founding members of that as well. And uh, that PEN project was designed to get more multicultural, more um, First Nations women in, into um, into wanting to run and get elected. And so Fenella is like the next stage where we're actually, and we've got on our, on Emily's List National Committee, I think we've got four First Nations women now, which is the largest number we've ever had in history. So we're very proud, very proud of that. Isn't isn't that terrible? Like in this day and age, it's like I've oh got four women. We're so proud. Like four indigenous yeah. women. This far out. That is, and, and particularly like even if you take it at a local level, there are very few indigenous councillors locally and yep. then that feeds through too yeah so there's only i think only one in victoria there's only one first nations uh councillor in victoria um there's uh, i think there's quite a few up in north uh, northern territory there's quite a few first nations people up there so i think there's a total of something someone said to me like 200 first nations councillors oh. in total around the country um and majority of those like 100 or 160 are from northern territory and queensland so wow. um so the bulk of them are from there majority um so yeah it's pretty it's we should be having more considering that you know well first nation people have been here for so long but um <laughs> but they haven't always obviously been given the opportunity or the rights so that's something that we really need to really need to be aware of as well because that adds a, a completely an apologies for saying indigenous should have been first no nation. that's fine that's fine it should like that's like the double whammy isn't it being indigenous and or being first nations and a woman is <laughs> That's yeah, great, and basically. yeah, and, and that's something that in the first wave of feminism, a lot of First Nations women did say that, like, yeah, yeah. For, for you know, white women fighting for feminism, that's great, but we're just fighting for rec a lot of First Nations women at that point in time were just fighting to for to be to to have the right to vote, just to be considered as a citizen in this country. So that was the that is something that we really uh, are aware of, and that's why we have such a big focus, and we are so keen to get more First Nations women interested in, involved in local government's fantastic getting involved in working for MPs getting invo involved in a pol policy and working in these systems where you can actually make this change that's where it's really important to do that so just before we wrap up I'll put all the links to your websites and everything fantastic on the the page uh, that goes with the episode but thank you so much it's been so much fun talking to you thank you I really enjoyed it too Karen so much fun thank you If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and don't forget to rate and review this podcast and share it with your friends. Thanks so much for listening and I hope you're leaving with some thought-provoking information that can make a difference in your life. See you next time.